I am going to introduce our speakers and then pass it on to them. Our first speaker and the moderator is Tony Cohen. Tony? He's the one who's not a woman. Tony is a historian, author, and explorer of the American past. An early purveyor of experiential history, Cohen launched his career in 1996, walking two months from Maryland to Canada along a route of the Underground Railroad, the secret route to freedom for American slaves. Cohen's journey will be chronicled in a documentary, Patrick and Me, A Personal Journey on the Underground Railroad, to be released late in 2019. Cohen is president of the Monaire Foundation, a nonprofit preserving the legacy of the Underground Railroad, and operates the Button Farm Living History Center, a farm depicting 1850s plantation life in Maryland. He's been a consultant to the National Parks Conservation Association, Maryland Public Television, NASA, among others, and trained, this is an amazing story, trained Oprah Winfrey for her role as Seth in the 1998 motion picture, Beloved. He has served on the Governor's Board for Tourism Development for the state of Maryland and has worked for the past decade as an interpretive consultant for the Harriet Tubman Underground Railroad Byway in Maryland and Delaware the design review team for the National Park Service's Harriet Tubman Underground Railroad State Park and Visitor Center in Blackwater, and is director of historical interpretation for the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation. Cohen received his BA in American Studies from American University, and he makes his home in Montgomery County. 2019 marks the 25th anniversary of Cohen's book, The Underground Railroad in Montgomery County, a History and Driving Guide, a 40-page monograph published by the Montgomery County Historical Society in 1994. The seminal work was the first comprehensive study of the Underground Railroad in Maryland and the greater Washington metropolitan area, and one which has sparked ongoing scholarship and interpretation within our county's history, tourism, and preservation sectors, and is the inspiration for our presentation today. Cheryl. Cheryl's in the middle. <laughs> Cheryl Spicer is the countywide museum manager for the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission, Department of Parks. And with over 25 years experience working in museum education, she's responsible for the general management of interpretive programming for Montgomery Park's his historic sites. Among those historic sites under the administration of her and her staff, our Oakley Cabin, African American Museum and Park, Kingsley Schoolhouse, the Agricultural History Farm Park, Woodlawn Manor Cultural Park, which houses the new Woodlawn Museum and the Underground Railroad Experience Trail, and the Josiah Henson Park. A native of North Carolina, Ms. Spicer previously served as the curator for community history for the North Carolina Museum of History and as Education Director and Registrar of the Museum of the Albemarle. Her career began in museum education at the Greensboro Historical Museum in Greensboro, North Carolina, then continued at the Mariner's Museum in Newport News, and the Abby Aldrich Rockefeller Folk Art Museum at Colonial Williamsburg in Virginia. Spicer is a graduate of the University of North Carolina at Greensboro with a BA in History and a graduate of Hampton University with a Master of Museum Studies. And last, but certainly not least, is Nancy Picard. Nancy is a historic preservation and community planning professional with a passion for protect, protecting non-renewable resources. In her current position as Executive Director of Peerless Rockville, she works with concerned citizens, volunteers, property owners, and local government agencies to identify, protect, and safeguard the city's heritage. Prior to her work in Rockville, she spent many hours researching and writing about the history of, and cultural resources of the Patapsco Valley with a focus on the mill and the community at Daniels. Other volunteer activities include advocacy efforts to develop a historic preservation plan for Howard County 
and increased tax credits for historic property owners. Nancy Hold, holds master's degrees in community planning and historic preservation from the University of Maryland and a bachelor's degree from Penn State. Nancy joined Peerless in 2012 and stepped into the role of executive director in the summer of 2014. Since then, she has immersed herself in discovering more of the rich hit history of the city she now calls home. And with that, my duties are complete and I will pass this on to Tony and the panel. Um, thank you, Matt. Could you bring us coffee, please? <laughs> Your duties are not complete. Just kidding. Shame. But coffee would be nice. Water would be good too. All right. Um, good morning, everyone. Great. Um, I'm Tony Cohen, uh, director, uh, president of the Monero Foundation. Can everyone hear me? Okay. So, what was that? Stay close to me. I'll stay close to it. <laughs> and um, I'm good with sign language, so uh, if I step back, you can't hear me, just go like this, and that'll be great. And that applies to all of us. Um, so today we're going to be uh, speaking about 25 years of Underground Railroad research in Montgomery County. And, um, oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> You're hired. <laughs> thank you. Um, and um, uh, we're going to uh, be looking at uh, programs, uh, research, um, and ongoing efforts to chronicle uh, this very interesting part uh, and previously hidden part uh, of Montgomery County history. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to go to 1145. Uh, the last 10 minutes or so will be reserved for your questions. Um, prior to that, we will have our uh, open panel. Um, and uh, kicking off, uh, we're each going to go through uh, about a five-minute intro with visuals, um, just to kind of uh, set the tone and let you know what we've been working on for the past 25 years. And um, yes, yeah, so I'll start off. Um, that's me. As Cheryl pointed out, a much older picture. I've used an old picture. Mm -hmm. Historical, Cheryl. Historical. So, um, just a little background. Um, I'm a graduate of American University. Um, I transferred there, I think, in 1993 as a refugee from the Corcoran School of Art and uh, landed in an American Studies program um, with half my credits under my belt. And so I had a short time at American University, but as part of my senior uh, uh, project, I was given the task of documenting some part of American history that had gone unrecorded. Oh, there we go. And I chose the Underground Railroad. Um, I chose Montgomery County, Maryland, it being a southern county in a southern state, but a border state as well, um, as my area of focus. And, um, as I go along, I'll tell you how I found the Underground Railroad or how the Underground Railroad found me, but um, um, uh, spent about six months working on this project. I was able to document over 30 points of interest in Montgomery County. Um, uh, buildings, um, uh, physical uh, landscape, geographical landscape, man-made landscape that had been used uh, in some way or connected in some way to the story of the Underground Railroad. Um, uh, wrote my paper, got an A, and then graduated with a, an American Studies degree, and then faced a mystery greater than that of the Underground Railroad, which is what do you do with an American Studies degree? So um, at the time, I was volunteering at Montgomery County Historical Society. Uh, one of the uh, archivists there asked to read my paper said it was pretty good. And um, uh, Montgomery County Historical got a grant uh, from Maryland Historical Trust to publish the paper in the form of a book, uh, which is the 
the little uh, pamphlet you're seeing now. And at the time, it was the first publication, a comprehensive publication, about the Underground Railroad in Maryland, um, and um, uh, certainly uh, the, 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 the first uh, uh, tackle of the topic in Montgomery County. Um, um, in the uh, ensuing years, it uh, sparked a lot of other research by um, uh, scholars across the community that took the story deeper. Um, in 1996, um, uh, while I was between jobs, uh, I took uh, two months to uh, retrace one of the routes of the Underground Railroad out of Montgomery County, uh, following it through five different states all the way to Canada by foot, boat, and rail. Uh, so that's the younger Spelter me um, uh, from Smithsonian Magazine. Uh, uh, me uh, uh, dressed as a runaway slave and me inside of a crate uh, that uh, I traveled part of my journey uh, uh, smuggled inside of a crate on an Amtrak train. Uh, interesting uh, topic for later. Uh, in 1997, uh, the story uh, uh, came to the uh, attention of Oprah Winfrey, who was working on the film Beloved, and uh, I brought her here to Montgomery County and did um, uh, what I would call my first uh, historical interpretation work, and that was using the history uh, and the elements of the Underground Railroad story to create an immersion experience for her, uh, which took place on an old plantation, uh, where she was blindfolded, uh, blindfolded, changed into slave cl clothing, dropped on this plantation, and then she had a 48-hour immersion um, in the uh, world of slavery and the Underground Railroad, all designed to inform her role in Beloved. Um, as a result of uh, uh, working uh, the Oprah Project and the uh, uh, media attention that um, it garnered, um, uh, I formed the Monaire Foundation two years later, a nonprofit to preserve the legacy of the Underground Railroad. Um, at the time, um, uh, Underground Railroad uh, research and scholarship was starting to get a second wind, if you will, um, from um, research in the earlier uh, part of the 20th century. And um, the story was uh, 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 growing new legs and uh, taking on uh, new energy. And so um, uh, my foundation um, uh, decided to work in four areas uh, that we put under the title Ride the Underground Railroad, research, interpretation, documentation, and education. And we'll talk about that today. Those will probably be the four main themes of our discussion. Um, most of our work is done through the Button Farm Living History Center in Germantown. And um, it's a 40-acre uh, farm inside of a 6,000-acre park uh, where we do uh, third and second in-person uh, interpretation and uh, depict 1850s plantation life in Maryland. Nancy. Oh, I'm next. You're next. I thought I was last, so Surprise. I'm jumping in. OK. Um, Hi, everyone. Um, I want to thank Matt and Montgomery uh, History for inviting me to be part of the panel, and Tony, actually, for inviting me um, to be part of this today. Um, I just want to start off by saying I don't have 25 years of history like these folks, so I'm definitely the new girl at the table here in Montgomery County. Um, but Peerless Rockville, the organization that I represent, um, does have a long history of working with Tony and being involved in research and interpretation, and I'm delighted to share some of that with you today. Uh, I've learned many things. Let me just I'll wait on that a second. Um, I've learned many things since I've come to Peerless Rockville, and we've been involved, as Tony said, in interpretation, research, identification, um, documentation, and education um, over many years. Uh, really looking at exploring and sharing the stories of not just the Underground Railroad, um, but slavery, um, the people, um, what Rockville was like, what Montgomery County was like before the Civil War, during the Civil War, uh, before and after slavery and its legacy. Um, 
I'll just mention, I can move on. Um, just a little bit about Peerless Rockville, in case you don't know. Uh, we are a nonprofit historic preservation organization located right here in Rockville. And we have a mission to protect um, the history and heritage of Rockville. And we do that through advocacy, research, preservation, protection of resources, and education. And we're very lucky to have our office in the historic red brick courthouse. Uh, which is in Courthouse Square, which is right in the center of town. I'm sure you, many of you have, if not all, have gone by it at some time. Um, in addition to being this being a wonderful place in the center of the city, in terms of the Underground Railroad and Rockville, it really is in the center of it all. It's in the center of the history, um, and it's a, a wonderful launching point from which to explore the Underground Railroad stories here in the county. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about that. Uh, one of the first things that happened, Tony did his research and he published his uh, booklet that he just told you about. And uh, he really opened an amazing can of, uh, not worms, more opportunity uh, for uh, additional research and growth. Um, Somewhere along the way, pretty early, I believe that he got to know Eileen McGuckian, who many of you know, and they became fast friends. Eileen was heading Peerless Rockville at the time, and um, she was just as excited by this research as Tony was. And um, over the many years, Peerless got more involved, and we started to learn that many of the resources, the historic resources around us, still stood. Many were lost, there have been many changes in Rockville, but there still are many things on the landscape that we could see today or take people to, um, to tell this story. Um, from that understanding grew um, what is still a program and that's the In Their Steps walking tour and you can see a lot of pictures of that now. Um, basically for many years now, we have led, they happen sometimes a couple times a year, sometimes once a year, uh, sometimes more, but we take people to a list of sites and um, really walk you in the steps of some of the enslaved persons and those that either really um, held them back or maybe helped them along the way. So we take you to places like the um, site of Rob's Tavern, uh, Christ Episcopal Church that was believed to have a, a safe place for um, uh, enslaved people seeking freedom. We, the courthouse itself, the site of the jail where um, enslaved people uh, were often held um, after trying to escape before they were returned. Uh, and many other fascinating sites, including the Bell Dawson House, churches, other taverns and, and, and things. Um, that tour really made Peerless Rockville into a site on the National Network to Freedom. And um, that's the logo for the National Network to Freedom. And that really um, is a program, a wonderful program that throughout the country really um, connects all of the various sites on the Network to Freedom. So, what were some of the stories? Well. With the underground, um, with the network to freedom and the research, we realized that these rich and amazing stories that actually are very well documented and not only have an important story to tell about Rockville, are very important to the national and actually international stories, such as the story of Josiah Henson and the story of Anna Maria Weems, who you see here. Uh, both enslaved in Rockville, held in Rockville, worked in Rockville. Um, and a big part of the larger story picked up um, through abolitionists to help spread the word and work to end um, slavery. So in addition to that, uh, this research and our continued involvement in presenting the Underground Railroad led us to look into kind of the legacy. What remains, what happened to the people, what happened to the enslaved folks who did, folks who did not escape. Uh, what has grown from that, one of the things that's grown from that is a richer, much richer understanding of the African-American history of the communities in Rockville, kinship communities, 
education communities, churches. There's a very rich cultural heritage here in the city. And um, in learning more about that, when I came into my role, I said, this is wonderful. The educational story is amazing. And um, we had a document that is shown there. And this is a document that was a pledge by um, free and um, newly freed men, colored men, that's as they were termed, colored men in Rockville, um, pledging their own funds to house a teacher, house and feed a teacher and heat a school so that there could be education for themselves and their children. Uh, that led to the larger series, Emancipation to Integration, that we did a few years ago that really uh, walked through uh, many programs, this history from the very beginning of emancipation all the way up through uh, integration of the schools. Moving forward, we are very delighted that um, we received a grant from the National Network to Freedom to take our occasional In Their Steps walking tour and really expand it so that anyone visiting us in the Red Brick Courthouse will be able to, on any day, come and learn a little bit about the Underground Railroad here in Rockville. And um, we are working with Tony, um, and probably Cheryl, and many other people in the area uh, to get this exhibit up hopefully by this summer. Um, there'll be parts of it as early as May, and we really look forward to uh, putting that out to the public. That's kind of our future right now. Yes, there also is, um, there is an African American Heritage walking tour um, and a pamphlet that we have that you can walk yourself around the sites at any time as well. Thank you. All right. Hi. Good morning. Okay, so I am the museum educator, right? It's like call and response here, so good morning. Excellent. Thank you all. Thanks so much to Tony and Mitch for helping to put this panel together and the invitation to participate in the conference. This is uh, one of the favorite January activities is to come to the conference and a chance to participate is exciting and tell you a little bit about what we're doing with Montgomery Parks. For those who may not be familiar with Montgomery Parks, we are part of the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission. We're a bi-county commission that is uh, forged with the task of preserving primarily parks, but there are wonderful historic sites throughout both Prince George's County as well as Montgomery County. And we joke between Montgomery County folks and the Prince George's side that they may have started their interpretation of their African-American history history well before we did, but my, are we catching up, and we've got some exciting projects coming down the pike line. So for me, you heard a little bit of my background there. I'm Southern born and bred North Carolina girl who's happy to still be in the South, and I've been with Parks for about 10 years now. And it's been an exciting 10 years. Over this time period, we've had an opportunity to really grow our interpretive programs. And I'm stealing your ride. That research, interpretation, documentation, and exhibitions for us. And education is, OK, we're stealing that. You'll find that all over. Peerless Rockville stealing it. We're stealing it. We're all going to be able to educate everyone about riding the Underground Railroad. So before I get into our Underground Railroad sites that are specifically focused on that particular element of history, I do want to explain that with Montgomery Parks, we have a number of African American sites within our collection of parks that focus on the African American history. And with the inclusion of our newest park, the Josiah Henson Park, we're able to give a well-rounded story of the historical African American experience, which would begin with Henson's story and enslavement at the park onto our Woodlawn Manor Cultural Park out in Sandy Spring, where we look at what I call the resistance to slavery and this underground railroad movement and its activity there within the area, and then to looking at what freedom looks like for the new African American communities following emancipation and the end of the Civil War at Oakley Cabin, African American Museum and Park, and only just formally 
Brookville, we still share the Brookville neighborhood, as well as Newmantown, which is at the Agricultural History Farm Park in Durwood, and now the Harper Cabin, the Thomas Harper Cabin, which was in Poolsville, is now at the um, Brookside Nature Center, and it's been there for a long time. It's just now we are peeling back the history of it and beginning to share more of the research that's been done. So starting with the uh, Woodlawn Manor Cultural Park, this is one of the first parks when I got here that had a really inciting program that I was able to interpret. And this young man to my left here was helpful into putting together one of our most successful programs, the Underground Railroad Hike, the Experience Hike, which if any of you have come out to Woodlawn within the past actually 15 years now, and had an opportunity to trek through what is part of the Rachel Carson Greenway. It's a modern trail that's a part of a series of trails that go through um, this sort of middle area of the county. The Underground Railroad Experience Trail, though, is nestled within Sandy Spring, which is a part of, the, in, a part of our park, Woodlawn Manor Cultural Park. But it does have its historical ties to the Underground Railroad in that the portion of the Anacostia Northwest watershed runs through that property. And we know through documentation and oral histories that the enslaved did make escape moving through that area. So the grounds are covered with the footsteps of those who are escaping to freedom as you head out into the woods. They just don't go on that path. That path wasn't there. That path helps us to navigate our way through the woods as we tell their story. And what makes this program rather engaging is while it is not a full immersion experience, it is one where we take the visitors and we begin with the manor house. And in the center image at the top, and I'll tell you what these lovely people and why they're dressed as they are, um, Ellen Danis, who is portraying Mrs. Cleora Palmer, we're standing in front of the manor house, and the manor house begins our tour, but what we do is we will walk the visitor through the experience of one who has made a choice to escape. And when the visitors take the Underground Railroad Experience Trail hikes, they're learning about these choices that enslaved have to make. There are so many that remained in slavery and so many that took risk, that risked life, that separated them from family and friends for forever and all that they knew and were comfortable with to embrace freedom on their own terms. They had to self-emancipate in order to gain this freedom. And they do so in the choices that they make. How would they survive such a trip? Who would they trust when they're making this trek? Are they led by a conductor, someone who's experienced, who knows the terrain, who would be able to help them? If you're coming up from Southern Maryland and you're trying to get to Pennsylvania and you're moving through the county, who do you know who to trust? So many of the enslaved are illiterate, but it doesn't mean that they are not highly intelligent with keen senses of memory, and so they've memorized pathways and navigational techniques and the people they're supposed to look for, landmarks that will help them navigate their way, if they're traveling on their own, to get to freedom, as well as who to look for, who to trust. The other thing about the Woodlawn Manor Park area, it, its community of Sandy Spring, as you know, is one of the larger Quaker communities within the county there and Brookville area. And so there is a well above support as well as the free black community. That is an early free black community in the county there in Sandy Spring before the end of the Civil War. And so there they're able to find assistance from both the free black community, many of the whites in the area, but also those who are enslaved. Now, I, I'm a rambler, so Tony's going to keep me on time. We're not going to get too deep into it. She I want to tell my you. Mind. I know. I'm moving. I'm moving. So what we do programmatic-wise there, we still do the Underground Railroad hike. In 2016, we opened a project that took about 13 years to happen, and it was the Woodlawn Manor Visitor Center is how it began. And in the lower pictures on the bottom to the left and the right, inside the 1832 historic stone barn, it's a tri-level bank barn, stone barn that Dr. William Palmer built, we have taken that and what I have called, we've tricked it out with very modern, beautiful exhibits that focus on the Underground Railroad experience, the Quaker legacy, and the African-American free black communities within the area and throughout the county. 
Uh, when you get a chance to go there, we are open during the warmer seasons. It is an unconditioned space from April until November, but then we have also now recently called it the Woodlawn Museum. The carriage house, the 19th century carriage house, which was on the property, has also been... Uh, renovated and become an area where we can provide a gift shop and provide a number of resources for folks. We do a wealth of programs. The folks at the top, our newest program begun in 2011 was our Voices of the Underground Railroad where we brought first person interpretation on a night hike through this pathway where we introduced our visitors to characters that they learned about during the daytime but they got to meet in the evening. On the left, we have Chris Beard, who is a volunteer with us, who portrayed Enoch Howard, a free black resident of Sandy Spring. In the middle, as I mentioned, was Ellen Danis. And I thought I saw Ellen in here. She could wave a hand, our little star. Mrs. Cleora Palmer. And then on the end, we have Reverend Samuel Green, who's portrayed by one of our volunteers, uh, Carl Smith. The other site we have, and something I think Tony will mention, is we these sites that we have are on the Network to Freedom, which is the Underground Railroad, the National Park Service's Network to Freedom. This particular site, the William Chaplin Arrest Site, is in Silver Spring, and it is not a structure, but an interpretive sign that marks a location of where one of the abolitionists, this is uh, William Chaplin, who was an abolitionist from New York, who helped to put together one of the largest attempted slave escapes with the Pearl incident many of us know about with the Edmondson family and their girls and working to help spirit them out of the area, which unfortunately was unsuccessful. But he ended up getting arrested in 1850 in this location. And it's kind of at the border of DC and Silver Spring and this signage is located in the historic Jessup Blair Park. Yes? Okay. Oh, okay. All right, I'm turning back over to Tony. We're going to save the best for last, it seems. All right, thank you very much. <laughs> Excellent. So, um, esteemed panel, uh, just a, a, a few questions to uh, uh, start us off. Um, what is, for each of you and the projects you're working on, how would you define the Underground Railroad? Was the Underground Railroad uh, for you? Okay. Um, you know, I read a good description somewhere this morning, actually, when I was reviewing things, and I should have committed that one to memory. But um, really, the takeaway for me is that the Underground Railroad, it really was a network, and it was a network of people, um, black and white, enslaved, free, family, not family, and it extended, not just in this country, overseas, um, to help enslaved people attain freedom. And um, there are a lot of um, really meshed sites, and you know, I've now learned a lot about the Washington, D.C. area. Um, there's so much more to learn and explore, um, but I really see it as a pathway to freedom. For me, I think I touched on it in talking about our trilogy of historic sites within parks as I see it as this resistance to slavery. This to me is an ultimate example of a resistance of someone who's seeking freedom to get there by making their own path to freedom using this network of a variety of different folks. Um, it's. I think for me, that's the biggest thing, and, and to helping people to understand the risks that are involved for those who are both helping and those who are definitely making that escape, that it's a risk of life. It's a risk of leaving everything that you know, and that often is happening on both sides for those who are assisting and as well as those who are making that escape. And it's understanding and appreciating the choices the hard choices that were made for those who wanted to escape, who may have sent family on to escape, that mother that sent the oldest son and kept the youngest with them, thinking they weren't going to make it, but she wanted at least one to make it. So it's making those hard to choices. Thank you. Um, 
I think for me, um, the Underground Railroad is, I guess when I started researching the Underground Railroad, um, it was uh, part, part history, part myth. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, research um, has shown me, and like to hear what it's, uh, what it's uh, provided you with, but um, it's provided me with a real uh, sense of um, uh, uh, his, uh, hidden history, um, um, but a history um, that is uh, part past, part future. Um, um, what we know about the Underground Railroad and what makes the Underground Railroad so important, um, I think, is how it resonates with uh, people today um, how it's remembered, how it is uh, memorialized, and, uh, and so forth. So it's, um, it's an area of scholarship that I feel is continuing to move and evolve. Uh, back in the old days, um, uh, one way you found out um, and were able to document the Underground Railroad uh, was through um, written records, combing archives, um, um, uh, soon the historical community uh, uh, realized that you had to go into courthouse records uh, to get the information. Um, are we? Are, okay. Um, and we run to 1145, right? Okay. We'll, we'll go on a little bit more. Yeah, thank you. Um, um, uh, so, so then we started moving into primary documents. These were not primary documents that were interpreted as Underground Railroad. So uh, you know, I remember going into Montgomery County Historical Society when I started my research and asking, you know, what do you have on the Underground Railroad? Uh, and was told that the Underground Railroad didn't exist in Montgomery County because it was a southern county um, and it uh, sided with the, uh, with the, with the uh, Confederacy during the war. Um, uh, a week later, I was going through um, a file that used to exist called the Negroes file, um, and it was all the black history stuff, and um, found um, three references actually to the Underground Railroad, uh, which uh, inspired uh, further, further research. So even finding the documentation and being able to interpret it as having an Underground Railroad connection was a whole period of time in the 90s um, that we were slogging through. Um, so um, um, let me ask, uh, why the Underground Railroad, why now? Just jump ahead in time a bit. Why the Underground Railroad, why now? Ah. Why um, is it important? Okay, so personally, I think that it is critical and just coming from, okay, I'm just gonna put it out there for you all. Uh, just coming from an African-American perspective, I think it is critically important that we understand the history of this country, how we arrive at where we are right now and to understand what is going on every day around us, it is critical to understand the history of this country and what's happened. What's happening with the Underground Railroad and the fact that it was almost like this missing part of history. We go from Africans arriving to being enslaved and then they're free. And so there's this missing part of how did they get to freedom and that this underground railroad is part of this, and I'm keep going with the resistance thing that started when people got off the ship. It's like, oh, this is not for me. Uh-uh, never was. And so this resistance begins and now there is some order to it. There's a network that builds. Uh, there is this understanding the complexity of slavery and all of its different components, but for me, I think the Underground Railroad is critical in filling that gap of how people reached freedom before freedom was mandated for all, before we get to an emancipation, before we get to a civil war, which really puts the question of, of slavery out 
to be addressed by the entire country on a political front. I think it's looking at what the everyday people did to end this slavery and what they did to bring people into freedom and so forth. That's a very interesting um, perspective because I think for a long time, the Underground Railroad has been shrouded or nudged Just out like by the Civil War. Yes. Um, and, um, and I think uh, 20th century scholars in the first part of the century gave little uh, attention uh, mm -hmm. to the Underground Railroad. Mm -hmm. Now we know that there are, uh, were people, uh, uh, for instance, Wilbur Siebert in Ohio, a professor of European history who from 1892 to 1952 was researching the Underground Railroad by writing people all across the country, mm -hmm. country who's still mm -hmm. alive, saying how, how did you um, operate uh, your underground system? And um, you know, we even have three letters from Sandy Spring uh, uh, Quakers to Seabird describing the operations uh, there. So, you know, that history has, um, you know, really had to um, uh, leap forward, um, uh, part through catch scout, up. catch up, exactly. Uh, what is it to you? What is, why the underground? Why now? Um, thank you. I, I think for me, I mean, I totally agree with everything that Cheryl's just said. Um, I almost don't want to call it the Underground Railroad, though, now, you know, like, I, I, learning about it as a child, I got the, I got, you know, why, that it was a network, that it was transportation, that it was a route, um, and it is a network, but I feel like the stories that have to get out now um, have to encompass the slavery part, you know, and um, the humanization of the people and their escape to freedom, and what happened after, you know, it's that continuum. And um, at Peerless Rockville, you know, we look around us in the community, and there is so much rich history um, that can inform not just Rockville's story and Montgomery County story and DC stories, but like I said, the larger story that happened really steps around the courthouse where I work every day. And um, I think today, um, one of the reasons why it's important is that research has been going on for 25 years now and people have taken it and the Network to Freedom has taken out and books have been published and digital records have made research so much easier that now we just know more and it's, it's, it needs to be shared with the public. Excellent. Um, we're going to take a few more minutes, if that's okay, before opening it up to questions. Uh, and we're on to 1145, correct? <laughs> Um, uh, along the theme of um, Ride the Underground Railroad, restoration, interpretation, mm -hmm. documentation, mm -hmm. and education, um, could each of you um, talk about briefly one surprise um, that has emerged um, in your scholarship in your working of, um, of uh, any of those uh, categories? I'll, I will go and I will talk about something <laughs> that I, I don't, I, I guess for me it was more of a surprise, maybe Tony knew more about this. Um, you know, so in looking at the Underground Railroad and the stories, um, we've done the tour, we've gone to the sites, We've heard about the escapes, and they're all fascinating, wonderful stories. But one of the things, you know, that we start, I think we're looking a little more at now is, well, why? Why were these people fleeing? What was the cause? Because so many people didn't want to leave their home. I mean, they may have been enslaved, but these were still their home, and they had family around. Um, so we start to look at that and start to look a little bit more about the, at the domestic slave trade which, you know, really um, had roots, many roots, right here in Rockville, in Montgomery County, in the D.C. area, um, you know, moving slaves who were not as needed after, after the tobacco um, fields were not, you know, being worked anymore, but they were being sent south. And it was a very profitable trade, and what we found is it was happening to a large degree right here, uh, 
in our backyard, literally. And um, we will be presenting more of that when we come, go forward on our exhibit. But that's been a real surprise to me to learn more about how um, ingrained that was here, right in Montgomery County. Thank you. So can I do that? Yes. Now? Thank you. Okay, so the biggest surprise, I think, for me coming into the area from, from North Carolina and learning about the Underground Railroad and the activities here was learning about this one man, the Reverend Josiah Henson, and being introduced to this newest park that had been acquired by Montgomery Park and understanding through these past 10 years of learning the intricacies of his life growing up enslaved here in Montgomery County, but also looking now, the research continues to his experience as a conductor on the Underground Railroad, and Lord knows I could spend the rest of the day telling you about this wonderful man. I will not. I will not. I will not. I will encourage you, though, to purchase the book, which is coming out. We've done our new biography on the Reverend Henson. But for me, what is exciting and unknown and surprising still are the number of people who do not know about uh, the Reverend Josiah Henson, who, though born in Charles County, is reared here on the former Riley Plantation, which is kind of down the street in um, what was Rockville, now North Bethesda, right on Old Georgetown Road. And you've passed the house a gazillion times, day in and day out. This is it pictured on the upper left of this house, this residence, with its old log kitchen, which is that log building that's attached to the frame structure. But in learning about his life, it's learning about the risk that he took, the path that he took, the opportunities that were available to him during enslavement, and then how he wrote the rest of his life history after he escapes to freedom and in Canada. And by the way, in Canada, he is a rock star. He's there, Frederick Douglass. So, you know, we have a lot of work to do here in Montgomery County in Maryland and on this side of the U.S.-Canadian border in bringing awareness to the role that he plays and helping us to understand this experience of enslavement and the role that this neighborhood site takes in helping people to understand the history of Montgomery County as well as Maryland. What's shown in the pictures is we've been uh, interpreting the site over the past 10 plus years, we acquired in 2006, and there's been a wealth of archeological excavations going on there over the past 12 years, with over 30,000 artifacts that have been excavated during this time period. But what that has provided for us is oftentimes the physical evidence that we wanna see. We who go to museums, we're drawn there by the artifacts, and there are not a lot of artifacts as in clothing or furnishings or even the slave quarters that remain on the property. But what's been unearthed in these teeny tiny objects helped to paint the picture of what this experience was living there, the ceramics, the ironworks, the horse bridle, horseshoes, these sorts of things that helped to demonstrate how people lived, how he survived during the time period. And so that for me is surprising and we'll continue the research and continue to uh, delve into his experience as a conductor on the Underground Railroad as well as making his escape on the Underground Railroad out of Kentucky. Thank you. Um, I think the thing that's been the biggest surprise oh. to me is we find documents, records of people who were involved in the Underground Railroad uh, by you know, outright resistance, escaping, assisting those, whatnot. Um, but then we continue to dig down. Um, when I was uh, in junior high school, uh, my high school, my junior high school, uh, uh, Tilden, uh, was a block and a half away from the Henson home. And in 1976, uh, uh, Montgomery County Historical Society put out a grateful remembrance. Um, a 200 year uh, look back of Montgomery County history. And that's the first time I learned of Henson, that he lived in this house. Never would I imagine all those times I snuck up to the window of that uh, outbuilding, thinking it was Uncle Tom's cabin and peered through the glass. Would I ever thought, have thought that one day Parks would own it, that one day, um, you know, film crews would be out there doing documentaries mm -hmm. and there would be archaeological digs and so forth. So um, it's a story that keeps uh, uh, providing deeper, deeper levels of understanding 
Um, and that's my biggest surprise. I'd like to open it up for questions. Um, yep, uh, gentleman here. Two quick ones. Alfred was mentioned. What happened to Alfred? Does anyone know what happened to Alfred? He was in one of the, he was a runaway, and there was an advertisement. And two, is there any um, any guess at the numbers involved here? That's uh, great. I, I think I can take both of those. Um, uh, as of now, we don't know what happened to Alfred Homer. Um, the um, house we believe um, that he escaped from or that he lived in is that still stands uh, uh, in Rockville and is on the tour, though it's much changed. Um, in terms uh, of, um, of um, numbers, um, it's estimated that between 30,000 and 100,000 people escaped uh, to the North and Canada during the period of the Underground Railroad, which is officially around 1830 through 1865. And a lot of that was different waves of migration. So uh, people would go into the free states prior to 1850, once the fugitive slave law extended the power of slaveholders to go into the North and re, you know, uh, grab their slaves, then they went to Canada. Yes, correct, correct. So uh, if you were enslaved in Texas, you went to Mexico. If you were in Florida, you went to the Caribbean, things like that. So all the people going to Canada came through here or not? No. Uh, no, not through, no, no, not through Maryland. Um, uh, in this region, the, uh, up the Delmarva, uh, you know, through uh, Delaware, um, uh, uh, mountains, uh, uh, a, a lot of Underground Railroad uh, traffic up the Mississippi River, River Valley to the Ohio and so forth. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. Oh. Hi. Hi. Good afternoon. And good thank afternoon. you all for being here sure. to present this wonderful history. It's wonderful in the way that it is being exposed and talked about. So one of the things that is a couple of things I have about talking about our history in terms of the Underground Railroad, the enslavement of African people. It's actually a part of American history. Mm -hmm. It is American history. Mm -hmm. This is so much a part of American history, it's amazing that we have to separate, we've separated it out. It's not taught in the schools. Mm -hmm. So my question is, what process or who do you know right now, or is, you know, what steps have you taken to get this in the school system, like the Maryland school, anywhere? I'm, mm -hmm. I'm actually um, originally uh, not from this area. I'm born and raised in Texas, Houston, and when Where I was, my mom's from. <laughs> and when I was growing up, you know, I actually thought that the Underground Railroad was an actual railroad oh, underground yeah. somewhere yeah. and did not even understand yes. the process. So it's like something that needs to be taught as just a part of American history so that we can eliminate some of this yes. ignorance that is really clouding the whole mm -hmm. conversation going on, not just the yeah. conversation, but the actions and things that are going on right now in the country. Well, let me turn that over to Cheryl. Oh, okay. So for the Henson site particularly, as well as our other sites, we have always catered to our school groups. For the Henson site, our focus has been on fourth through eighth grade students, and with the archeological excavations that have been ongoing, we have been, in the past four and a half years, been able to provide field trip opportunities for students, particularly Title I students coming out of the DC and uh, Montgomery County areas through a grant that brought in, ooh, I'd say like 3,000 students over four and a half years coming to the site to learn about Reverend Henson. We give materials that go to the teachers in the classroom. We are expanding our teacher resources so that they can access them both online as well as getting classroom experiences. We're in conversation with those with MPC, uh, MCPS to find a way to incorporate Henson into the curriculum 
for our county students. And with that, we have what we call our neighborhood schools. And so during the course, while we're closed during construction, we're gonna continue to build relationships with our neighborhood schools. Because once you adopt a school, teachers, you all talk and you spread the good word of these resources that are available right next door. You don't have to go down to Virginia to learn about enslavement or the Underground Railroad experience or the Civil War. You can stay right here and learn about all of these different things. So we continue to network with our teachers, with our schools, with our um, social studies coordinators to ensure that they know about the resources, that they can come and see, that we can come and see them, and then find a way to get into and infiltrate what I call it the curriculum yes we have one minute left one question left one minute i'll ask this quickly um you, you quoted some numbers about the number of slaves who escaped do you have any concept or idea of the number of slaves who were able to buy their freedom or the number of enslaved people who were volunteered voluntarily um yeah, um, that's by. easy to answer. Yeah. We don't know. Um, <laughs> manumissions, um, uh, which was the term of the time, um, or self-emancipation as um, is one of the terms that's used today. It's also used for the Underground Railroad. But um, we do have a, 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 a one story, uh, Josiah Henson's uh, uh, brother from, yes. from Rockville. I'll mm -hmm. let Nancy mention that quickly. Uh, so. Josiah Henson's brother was actually, you know, a slave uh, held by the Bell family um, at the Bell Dawson house. Well, he worked for the family. It's believed to have been there at the house and um, was actually um, manumitted. Did, was he, he was purchased by he Josiah. Purchased. He was purchased, yes. Josiah Henson did return to purchase his brother from the Bell family, and that's just another really layered and interesting story that is just right here um, that we hope to get out. And Tony, there was one other person that I think had a question, like one row back, there that really is, seemed bummed. We are at 11.45. <laughs> so so here's what I'm, oh, what I'm gonna, <laughs> yes. I can do it in 30 seconds. Okay. <laughs> My father was a map maker, and places have personas. Mm -hmm. And I've moved 22 mm -hmm. times in my life. And so as we wow. went all over the place, we really got a feel for the, the persona and the feel of a place. I got a, a shout out to the Historical Society. I got a great book for my children, The Green Book. And oh, it yeah. just occurred to me, has anybody mm -hmm. ever done an overlay of the Green Book map to an underground railroad map? That is an excellent yeah, question. I don't believe. Because I believe that places have kindness. I, do, I yeah. don't believe um, that anyone's done that. I will say this, um, uh, the, the book that uh, Montgomery uh, his, History uh, published, uh, the Underground Railroad Driving Guide from 1994, right. My foundation is upgrading that. It's going to be a statewide book right. uh, called Great Escapes. Uh, and so it'll be the history county by county along with driving, driving uh, tours. Um, uh, that will be out this summer. Um, but I believe places do have kindness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think uh, for all of our projects, that's at the core of the interpretation. Uh, it just, is what was the heart of the community? Um, okay. How does how did that uh, history come to be then, and how mm -hmm. does it resonate today? And on that one, going over two minutes. <laughs> my apologies. Yep. I'm going to take us over 30 seconds. I'm going to take us over 30 seconds on top of it. Just because you brought up books and you mentioned books and resources that the purchase of Henson's brother comes through the sale of his autobiography. It's written in 1849. He's the inspiration behind Uncle Tom's Cabin main character, but there is a new autobiography uh, that Parks has produced. Our researcher and historian, Jamie Coons, has spent the past 10 years as we've been working towards getting the exhibits for the new museum that's coming online. Yeah, it's gonna be there. 
And <laughs> but this book is going to be available next month. There are forms where you can order it online, but it's sharp flashes of lightning come from black clouds. This is a quote coming from Henson's autobiography, as well as maps define places and give them character words, direct us. His words help to direct us and learn about his life story and paint the picture for so many lives. That's all I got to Okay, wait, I'm going to do it. There just because. Open um, it up. Jenny Masur just uh, retired yes. from leading the underground, um, the National yeah. Network to Freedom here, you know, and working with everyone. I had the privilege to meet her a couple times, and um, she was pretty dedicated, and I think paid a lot of attention. Um, very timely, two days ago in our mailbox came this new art copy, Peerless Raffle copy of Heroes of the Underground Railroad that she wrote, and it's all stories of the Underground Railroad from in and around DC, heroes, escapes, and things like that. It's just out. My understanding is it's just pretty much recently out. So these will be two, um, in addition to the books that Tony's talking about putting out, and others that already exist. You can uh, read more in many places, and if you want more information on that, come see any of us. Yep. Thank you. The three of us will stand up, step <laughs> out into the hall, so uh, the- uh, Next panel. Yeah, next panel can get their table, and we'll be there to answer questions. Thank Thanks. you all very much. <laughs>